All right. Welcome back to the Dojo Podcast. I am Naya Kete. You guys were introduced to me through Zahara last week in when she interviewed me. And now here I am interviewing one of my closest sisters in the world. I have Whitney Meyer as the guest on the podcast today. Whitney and I first met when we were on The Voice season two. Was that how long ago was that? Was that it was a long time? It's like 10 years at this point. Like, well, I think it'd be 10 years that it aired next year. Okay. Wow. Whoa. Yeah. That's yeah. insane. We got to do some kind of reunion for sure. Yeah. For sure, for sure. But um, I have watched this woman grow and evolve and continue to meet her edge and evolve beyond it over and over and over and over again. And uh, so I'm really excited to be sharing her with you all, her artistry, her creativity, her kindness, uh, everything that she is. Uh, I'm so excited to share it all with you. So with that, Whitney, I'd love to start with your background in music if you would tell us a little bit about your music you you know the family that you grew up in and uh, and then we'll just take it from there and see where the conversation takes us okay um so my background in music started pretty young um both my parents were musicians much like you Naya and um and so I grew up kind of around them playing my dad was in a ska band in the 90s, which was um, for like anyone who's old enough to, to remember the 90s. Ska was pretty cool, no doubt, sublime. They were, you know, like on the radio. And um, so that was a big influence of mine of watching my dad on stage and tour um, the country doing that. And I grew up um, singing as young as like five and really, really wanting to be an artist and wanting to be a performing musician um from a super early age and it's just it was like a deep I really feel like I was born with the desire to do it um because I don't ever remember a time where it clicked and where I was like that's what I want to do it just always was there um and I started off singing that's my main thing singing and writing but I play guitar and piano and I do a little bit of production as well again much like you Naya (laughs) and so Naya can also play the bass (laughs) and um I um So I started off doing vocal lessons pretty young and then started writing songs with my dad when I was like early teenager. And um, and then my dad and I were in a band together for a while in my early 20s. He's a pretty cool dad. So we got like pretty, pretty close Mm -hmm. and we played South by Southwest. We got a tour bus and we like booked ourselves all over very grassroots DIY, really like pulled ourselves up by our bootstraps, if you will. And um. And then in 2012, I auditioned for The Voice or 11, no, 12. And um, and I was still living in Reno where I'm from at the time. And and I got on and it was cool. And I met really amazing people like you. And, um, and then I moved to LA shortly after that and worked as a singer, songwriter and session musician and live performance artist for um, the better part of a decade. And then last year, towards the end of the height of the pandemic, I moved back to my hometown. I got my real estate license and I'm still doing gigs as well. So that's kind of the short synopsis. Yeah. So tell me, because you've, I've watched you just go through some pretty astounding transitions and life changes and choices and all of the things. I'd love to start with your decision to move to Los Angeles so funny enough when we were on the voice Whitney and I like were on different teams she was team CeeLo I was team Blake so we didn't spend a lot of time together it wasn't until she moved to LA that I actually we actually got to be really close friends and I'm curious like you know, what was going through your mind at that time when you were thinking about, you know, moving to Los Angeles, you had just done the voice and, you know, you're an independent artist 
doing the thing of like going to LA and pursuing the dream Yeah. and what's going through your mind at that time. What's going through your heart. What's it, what's your vision? What do you want to create? And what did you end up creating? Mm. Yeah. So speaking of um, your edge, that definitely applies to part of the reason. I mean, many of the reasons why I went the, um, the main reason everybody could guess is that, um, you know, I'm from a smaller town and they were really supportive of me on the voice, but I definitely felt like I had reached a ceiling there where there was kind of like, okay, I could, I've played the best places in here. I've sold 1700 tickets and like a big theater that like, you know, touring artists come through, like, what else can I do here? There's really nothing else I can do here. I've kind of, I've done it so I can stay where everybody makes me feel good because they know who I am and they'll come to the show. But for how long I, I very much sense that, um, that there's an expiration date of that if you don't bring it to another level. So um, I wanted to be challenged. I wanted to work on my songwriting. I wanted to work on, um, I wanted to work on more like traditional songwriting because I had pretty much just honed my own skills on my own um, before and I wanted to co-write more. And then on top of that, um, at the time I was not publicly out as a bisexual person. And um, when I did come out, it definitely strained my dad and I's relationship. We're super, super close. Always been a big daddy's girl. Um, and obviously I said, we, we grew up writing together. So I basically like my musician identity was wrapped up sort of in my dad and our relationship. And, um, and when we, when, when the voice ended, I told him that, you know, I had a girlfriend and we were in love and I was like, I, you know, I don't know what to tell you. And he's super Christian and very right-winged <clears throat> and it really strained our relationship. So that was part of it too, is I wanted a fresh start and I wanted like to be my own person apart from the expectations of my family. And my dad and I have a good relationship now, but it was, it was one of the most stressful times in my life when I was considering telling him about it, because it wasn't just like my dad, who I only see on Christmas or like the weekends or something like we, we were in a music business together for like 10 years. So it was, it was a really deep connection that, that was severed for a short time. So. I, I want to pause there for a minute because that's such a big uh, piece. And I know that so often, you know, there's so much wrapped up in identity, not only for ourselves, like how we identify ourselves, but how others, how the world mm -hmm. see, sees us, like mm -hmm. who the world decides that we are. Mm -hmm. That was a really pivotal moment for you when you decided not only to own the way it is you've feel about yourself to yourself, but also to own that within the context of your family and the context of the public. And mm -hmm. all, I mean, that you're an artist who's selling out 1700 seat shows in your hometown, killing it, just gotten off of the, you know, a, 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 a international platform where you're being mm -hmm. exposed to literally millions. And now you're like, okay, now the world knows me as this, and I'm going to come out as something totally different to it, to my very religious family. Mm -hmm. And so like, what gave you the courage in that moment to do that and, um, and, and, sh and share that piece of yourself mm -hmm. with your family and with the world? Yeah. I think part of it, um, was how much love I had for my partner at the time. <laughs> I was so completely in love with that person. And, um, I would have done almost anything to have that love continue. Um, and I think the other part of it, not to say that, um, that if you're not an artist, you can't, you, you can't get to the same conclusion, but I think as a creative and someone who relies on their intuition to make their living, m meaning, um, you know, we, we, as a performer, you use, you use your emotions and you use how you're feeling, you use the mood, you use the vibe. And as a result, you're very um, attuned to that stuff in the room as well and in other people. And I think that, um, when you do that, you kind of have to, you kind of have to be authentic. Otherwise people read that if you're, if you're faking it like really hardcore and you're not being yourself, I think people can really read that. And that doesn't mean that you can't, you know, um, what's the, not, not be the change you want to be, but like dress for the job you want. I think you can definitely like posture a little bit to, to arise to another version of yourself, but you can't, pretend to be something you're not because people see through that. And I think, I think that's a big part of it is I just, I couldn't not tell him anymore. Like, even if it jeopardized our relationship, it, 
would hurt less than me not being myself, which, which is weird to say, but yeah. 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 Well, if you're going to be uncomfortable, you might as well be uncomfortable at like being your most authentic self than being uncomfortable, not being your most authentic self. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, okay. So you have this epic experience, you come out to your dad and you, but, and you had this really challenging relationship for some time, but then you also healed it. So can you talk about that process of what it was like to not only be in the discomfort of him getting to know and accepting this new version of you, but, but actually navigating the healing that mm-hmm. you went through with your dad. Cause that's something for me. Uh, I know I'm like, I'm such, I mean, you know, me, I'm such a straight shooter, like be direct, get to the point, you know, kind of a sister. But like, when it comes to my parents, it takes <laughs> everything, <laughs> everything <laughs> to, 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 to go through the conflict. Right. And that's like yeah. one, definitely one piece where like, I, if, if there's any, any relationship, I avoid relationship drama. I avoid it's the drama with Mm -hmm. right yeah it's such but you know your your internal family system is so important to you know how it is you show up in in other way in uh, other aspects of your life and how it is you show up in the world so I'm curious like what did it take to to heal that and how did you do that yeah um it definitely took a lot of time I think one of the one of the I just remembered one of the main ways that I um I think healed part of that for myself and got the courage to <clears throat> say something about it to my dad um, was I read the book, A New Earth by Eckhart Tolle, which I'm sure um, this this crowd <laughs> will definitely be somewhat familiar with that. Mm-hmm. It's such a good book. Um, I should really reread it. It's been a long time. But for anyone who doesn't know it, um, loosely, I'll I'll loosely explain what it talks about. It talks about identity and ego and how, um, how basically the ego is, is your identity and your sense of yourself. They're like one in the same thing. And so you're like, I'm a woman. I am a white woman. I am an American. I am a, like this person's daughter. I'm, you know, you have all these, I'm a musician. I am a creative. You have all these identities we lay on top of ourselves. And then when something bumps up, bumps up against that identity, you feel threatened because that identity is you and you've accepted that as you, even though um, we come to learn through different spiritual practices that that's not true, but we all naturally um, take that on from a young age because it's easier to understand the world when it's compartmentalized. And um, so I think in reading that, I really understood about myself, but especially my my parents, where I had some empathy from his perspective I was like, okay, in his mind, like, you know, he's a 65 year old man having, who really very much believes in Christianity. And that's like his law, you know, like that's the way it is. And that's the truth. And that's the thing. And that is a part of who he is. And if Christianity says that homosexuality is bad and his daughter is homosexual, but he loves her, he's coming up against an identity crisis at the age of 65, which is hard, even at, I'm 35. And when I come up against identity crises, it's hard and it tears me apart. So I can't even imagine twice my age, it, you know, is having, and I think a man who in general, <laughs> they're a little little less fluid, not in general, as a stereotype, they are less fluid than, than women when it comes, you know, they can be harder and like tougher and have more um, learned behaviors that they feel they have to put on. And um So I had empathy for my dad. I was like, okay, that's got to be tough for him because he can't leave this thing that he's convinced himself is who he is, but he also still loves me. And he has to find some middle ground there. Um, So that book helped me a lot. And um, I think just continuing to not hide it. Like after I said it, you know, I, I, he would invite me to things and I'd be like, yeah, I'm going to come like, can, you know, can my girlfriend come? Like, is that okay? Cause we're, cause we're a unit. And usually I would bring a boyfriend if I had a boyfriend. So can she come? And at first, you know, he was like, well, I don't know. And I was like, well, then I'm not going to come, but thanks for the invite. And like, you know, she's my partner. So I'm going to treat her just like I would any other partner. And, um, so that's kind of how I did that over time. And then, and he never really came around to that particular partner, but, but he did come around to accepting me for who I am. He's still very Christian. Um, and he doesn't love it, but he'd also, 
knows that that's who I am. And he doesn't, you know, I talk about it with him freely. Like I'm ending, well, I'm sure we'll get to this at some point, but I'm exiting a relationship. I'm in the process of that right now. And, and my dad was like, well, maybe you'll find a good man, blah, blah, blah. I was like, or a woman, because I'm still bi, even though I'm dating a man. And I still say it even now, just to kind of remind him, not spitefully, but just like, hey, that still exists. And like, we're still there. But um, so I think it just took time. And I honestly give my dad a lot of credit. I think he um, he learned how to compartmentalize and he learned how to love me and he learned how to real, or he learned how to still, he learned how to keep my love, keep the love he has for me and his Christianity in the same being. And, um, and I think that he, um, he realized our relationship was more important than what he thought I should or should not be doing. Yeah. yeah. And what's that like? Like, so now you, you're, you know, this is what, how a, a decade later or something like that. Yeah. Almost exactly. Yeah. And like to know that he's accepting but he doesn't like it, but he's figured out how to live with it. Like, what's that like for you as his daughter to, to, to like be in that relationship, knowing that your father is like kind of tolerating mm -hmm. the incredibly large aspect of your life, but doesn't necessarily like it, doesn't want it. Like how I feel like I've just watched you really, not just accept that, but like truly be okay with it, you know, like really love him through that. Like you figured out how to love him through that, even though he's not loving you in the way that it is you want to be, or in the way that you deserve, frankly, and you love him anyway, you know, like, yeah. How, where, what's that like? Hmm. Um, it's a good question. <laughs> I, um, I mean, I think it's, I think it's a couple things. One of them is not my favorite answer. So I'll do that one last. <laughs> um, I think it's um, partially that like that I have, because I was, I was raised pretty conservative as well. Like I went to Christian school for a little while and I grew up in the church. So like, I know why he thinks the way he does. And I know the, pre I know what it feels like to have that pressure to assimilate to that identity because I did it for the first 17 years of my life. And, um, and I know the pressure to, to, yeah, to, to be a part of that community and to maintain that identity and how much of you it becomes. And the other thing is, is like, I, there's times in my life where I wish that I could accept Christianity as like, what, what is actually going on and that like there really is a one creator god and i'm not sure what everybody's beliefs are but um for me personally i'm more agnostic i think it's very likely that there are higher powers and things but um but i do think it would be easier to just be like okay yeah whatever your religion is whether it's like islam christianity buddhism you just go oh, yes this is 100 percent it and i'm gonna follow this belief to the ends of the earth and i have these parameters that are clearly set out for me by people and there are books and rules i can follow and i'll be okay and that's the like, that's the underlying part. I'll be okay. But, um, so I don't blame anyone who fully subscribes to a religion because, because we all want to know what happens after we die. And if there was some way where we could truly know rather than just guess and kind of have feelings and, you know, in, insinuate from those feelings, then of course you'd want to do that. If you could, if you could, if you could, ensure that you were going to see all your friends and family when you died and be with them forever in this beautiful heaven. Like I, I understand why people would do that. And so, so I understand where he comes from in his faith, although I don't share his faith. Um, and then I think the other part is that um, I love my dad a lot. And I think it's, you know, where I have a pretty good relationship with both my parents, even though I, you know, I have my own like trauma and I say trauma lightly, I had a pretty, pretty safe childhood, but uh, we all, none of us get out unscathed <laughs> um, emotionally. And, um, and I think I wanted, you know, his approval. And so, and even though I don't get his approval on my sexuality, having in a way, his love is approval of me, whether or not he approves of my sexual, sexual orientation. Um, and I think, you know, I wanted that. So I probably, I hadn't really thought about it until you brought it up, but I, I probably swept, 
you know, a lot of hurt under the rug so I could reestablish the connection, which had, had been so important to me from the time I was a, a baby. So. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> wow, we've covered a lot in a very short <laughs> period of time. <laughs> we've got identity, we've got God, we've got <laughs> all, a whole bunch, uh, <laughs> sexuality, all of the things. Yeah. Um, so I'd love to dive in to your relationship to me <clears throat> and talk, I mean, talk about identity. A lot yes. has changed in your identity in the, in, in recent months mm -hmm. and, you know, the pandemic has shifted a lot for a lot of artists and creatives mm -hmm. in general, and it definitely shifted a lot for you. So I'd love for you to share, um, you know, just speak a little bit to, you know, who you are as an artist and where people can find your music and all of that, but then also who you've evolved into and what your relationship is to music now and how you're honoring your artistic self while becoming this like badass businesswoman. All yeah. the time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So, so I'll start by saying, um, um that yeah being being a musician is like one of the most amazing things <laughs> it's one of the most amazing skills or hobbies to have um definitely one of the most amazing jobs to have and there's like you and I've talked about it you know in certain different conversations but there's there's just it's the closest that I've ever gotten to like true meditation or like true connection to source or God or whatever, um, like performing on stage. And in, in, in those moments, um, I, what I feel super empowered and super connected to people who I've never met before who are, who are in the audience. And I feel like, you know, I'm not, I'm not in my head. I'm not thinking about things and I'm, I'm an introverted extrovert. So like in my daily life, I'm thinking about a lot of things and I'm overanalyzing the way I said something or, you know, what I posted and, um, and on stage that doesn't really happen for me as much. I just check out and I get to like be in flow and I get, I feel super connected and uplifted and I feel purpose and I feel, um, like almost like unity with, with people and things <laughs> and the music. It's like, it's the closest thing, you know, to like Nirvana or Ascension in my opinion. Um, and it's totally hold on. I want to, I, I don't mean to cut you off, but that you, oh, said, yeah. it, you said I'm in flow. Mm. That's it's such a great description of it. And it's like, how do you know that you're in flow? You know, like mm -hmm. for me, I know exactly what you're talking about. And it's like total presence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Matter has quieted yeah. and you are just like in the present moment in your zone of genius, in mm -hmm. your purpose, mm -hmm. feeling that unity, feeling that connection, that mm -hmm. energy in the room that mm -hmm. can't, that doesn't have a, uh, a name really, but it's totally tangible. You can't see it, but you can feel it. Yeah. How do you know, how do you recognize that state of flow? How do you know you're there? I mean, the, the way I recognize it is kind of what you said, like the chatter stops, the self-talk stops, the like the the voice that's criticizing or judgmental of myself or of others or the world stops. It's just like you're you're just you're just being and doing, and there's no like judgment on how it is. It just like feels and it feels great. Yeah. Like it feels really good. Yeah. Yeah. And I always feel so blessed. I feel like I had a leg up. In, in other peers of mine in that I always knew that mm. music for me was the medium through which I got to embody that state of flow mm. totally curious if that was if that's true for you if music if that was always music mm. or if you had to find it I think I think it was but I had to home in on it and figure out where exactly because it doesn't come from me necessarily in writing. Like we, we've had a lot of writing sessions and, you know, sometimes I struggle with like self-criticism in writing sessions. And, and there are times when I can get past that and I do feel some of that inflow. But for me, I had, to, I really found it through 
like practicing enough and being doing music enough so that when the time came to do the performance, I didn't have to think about it. So there had to be work put in for me to get there, I guess, to the, to the inflow. It didn't come naturally because I was really critical of myself starting out. So what would you say to somebody who deals with that, who like, you know, maybe has a tendency towards anxiety and mm-hmm. like making things a bigger deal than they are and, <laughs> and constantly being self-critical and judgmental mm-hmm. and like looking at, you know, looking at your friend who's mm-hmm. like in the same industry as you are and just somehow just seems to be it oh, yeah. comes easy and naturally. And like, why yep. can't I get that? Why isn't it that mm-hmm. easy for me? Like you made a conscious choice to exercise the musical muscle in a very real and practical way. Like I, I so admire your devotion to like <laughs> practice and, and your dedication to the amount of like co-writing sessions that you've done and networking and follow up and follow through and all of the things like that's not my zone of genius. Right. <laughs> but I'm, it's easier for me to just be in flow. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you had to consciously, you know, make that choice, mm-hmm. devote your time and energy to, to exercising and, and, and strengthening the craft of music for yourself in order to easily access that flow state. And so was that like, was that a conscious thing you knew you had to do, or were you just kind of doing it naturally? And then you looked back and realized, oh, that's what I did. I was taking care of myself in that way. Hmm. I think that, um, I think that I, I think it's a blessing and a curse that, that, that I can do that and not at all to take away from some, from someone else who's struggling with that, because I do understand that I, I have bad anxiety. I have a depressive tendencies as well, but I, but I, I err on the side of anxiety. Even when I'm depressed, I'm like a hyper productive doer. Um, but it doesn't come from like, oh, I've got to get this all done. And this is great. It comes from like a lack of not being good enough or feeling I'm good enough. And I need to do X, Y, Z, A, B, C, D, and then maybe I'll feel good enough. Um, and that's always a, that's a balance because, because in some ways that, that mentality is harmful to myself, but in, in listening to that voice a little bit, it got me to practice more, which gave me more confidence, which made me feel more myself, which made me value myself more and made me value the work that I put in. So it's, so I continue to kind of have some of that and I don't love it. I think there's a better way to frame it, but, um, but I think that, um, I think that I'm getting off track. So you're gonna have to <laughs> reel me back in and remind me if I got lost in the ether. Okay, so <laughs> So if I'm, if I'm understanding you correctly, it sounds like you, because of your anxious tendencies, you, in those moments where you were, you know, going down this loop and the spiral of maybe being self-deprecating or judgmental Mm -hmm. or having a not, having your version of not good enough play out, you decide in those moments that you're going to do, you're going to be like, you know what, I'm not good enough. So I'm going to. Uh, you're a high, you're a highly productive, yeah, anxious person. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. So, and then in the doing, because you're doing and you're practicing and you're pushing yourself to be better, you quote unquote, I say this mm-hmm. in quotes, quote better. Mm-hmm. Um, you're also actually becoming better. Yeah, is giving you confidence and yeah. actually alleviating the not good enough. And yeah. so for you it's been this really interesting dance of like, yeah, I know that I'm anxious and I don't want to be anxious, but at the same time, I'm grateful for the gift that this anxiety has given me to drive me to evolve and be better at my craft and Mm -hmm. dedicate that put in those hours of study and practice to become the artist that I am. And now I'm a master artist in these ways. And I feel really confident in that I can get to a, you know, get on stage to a sold out crowd of 17,000, it's, you know, 1700 people, 17,002, maybe (laughs) 1700 people (laughs) and feel and like, and feel really good and know exactly what I'm doing and access that flow state because I've put in that time. And so 
Is that like, right? Is that what I'm totally? And you're yeah. so good at that, like encapsulating what someone's saying. <laughs> and I think, and, and you hit on something that maybe is a way for me to um, specify is like, so, and, and that's not to say that, that, that I was just like, oh, I want to be, you know, like playing at the specific club where I saw my friend post and I'm very jealous. Like, why am I not playing there? Um, I don't automatically go, well, I'm going to play that club. I, I more go, okay, well, what can I do now? Like I can, you know, I need, how, how, how could I get there? Maybe networking with more people. Okay. I'm going to text like three people right now and like try to set up a jam session. So like, I, even though I wish I was there and I'm mad that I'm not like here, I'll figure out something I can do here that I'm guessing might help get me there. Yeah. And so it's a, so it's not a direct thing. And, and oftentimes I would be really anxious before those jam sessions. Like I would be doubting myself before I went there, but I just went there anyways. And, and like most anxiety, when you actually get to the thing, it's not as bad as we thought it was going to be like 99% of the time. So the more you do it, the easier it gets. And I mean, when I was a kid, I had terrible stage fright. I used to get like so sick. And I, the first couple of open mics I did when I was like 14, I sang with my back to the ground. Like, yeah, I was like that, that nervous. I ever knew that. Oh yeah. There was like, there's like a couple of videos of me, I think singing with my back to the crowd. Cause I literally Aww, like, I, was, I, know. <laughs> I think my dad had told me to do that because like, I think we'd been practicing and practicing. And I wrote like three songs and, um, like right before I was like, dad, I don't think I could do it. I don't think I could do it. And he's like, he's like, if you have to just turn around and I was like, are, are you serious? He's like, yeah, just turn your back to the crowd. I was like, okay. And he was playing guitar next to me. So yeah. Oh, that's a beautiful story about your dad too. Wow. Yeah. Sweet. I can see why you love him so much. Yeah. He's, <laughs> he's really, he really groomed me. That's another part, I think, with my like work ethic towards music that definitely came from my dad, but also so did that critical voice that I inherited, but it came from a place of love for my dad and it, um, it made me into the musician that I am today. So again, it's like a, it's a blessing and a curse in the same way. And he, he had, has plenty of times of kindness and especially now he almost ne he never gives me negative feedback. It's usually I'll be like, I'd be like, yeah, that was a pretty good show. I kind of messed up on that one song, but the rest was good. He's like, yeah, it was good. Yeah, you didn't mess up on that one song. <laughs> He's not like right. hard or anything, but, um, and I don't mind that. I'd rather have realness than just be like, it was amazing. If it wasn't, you know, it doesn't have to be, be amazing. It's never, we're, this is a human thing. If we don't get enough sleep, if, we're, if I'm in a weird mood, it, you know, comes off differently. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, you know, I think it's really important to, you know, for those of you who are listening, who are trying to do all you can to be more positive and live life with more joy and, you know, I, I are just craving, um, craving positivity, right? Like whatever your version of anxiety, for me, it's not anxiety so much. It's pressure. Like pressure yeah. is my kind of consistent kind of negative emotion that I feel on a consistent basis that has for me has been really powerful because it's like it you know when I was feeling pressure and putting pressure on myself that's when I got my ass to the gym and like yeah. you know what I mean and ended yeah. up losing 45 pounds because I was like putting pressure on myself to do that yeah. and that served me for a time yeah and now I'm like okay wow this thing that feels really shitty served me very well Mm -hmm. And now I want to do something different. And I think there's, there's just a way to be with all of it without compounding the negative effects of mm -hmm. those emotions. Yeah. Just a lot. If we understand mm -hmm. how to utilize these quote unquote negative emotions in, in a way that does serve mm -hmm. and then also recognize when it's no longer serving us, like, mm -hmm. okay, I've learned how to exercise my, mm -hmm. I'm going to practice music for X amount of hours muscle. Yeah. And I'm a killer songwriter now and a killer performer. Now I actually don't have to do that. Yeah. I can utilize my time in another way to develop another part of my being or aspect mm -hmm. of self or whatever I'm evolving into next. And like yeah. just noticing when it's time to mm -hmm. make that change, you mm -hmm. know, is really important. So Speaking of, you, you yeah. did ask me about the real, the next shift of identity as well. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah which, let's go into that. Yeah, that kind of leads right into there. And so, um, so I'll, yeah, I, 
so being a musician, like I'm, I'm sure a lot of the listeners can relate. Um, if they, you know, whatever, if you're passionate about something, it becomes like, it feels like it's a part of you. If you're, if you paint or you dance, or you really love reading or writing, it's like, it's like a thing that you put on yourself and the, the musician thing, especially and living in LA, it's a culture and it's a lifestyle. It's, it's literally a lifestyle. It's, I only hung out with musicians. Everything was about music. Every conversation was about music. Every, every party, every hang, every drink, every coffee was about music some way, whether it's like meeting someone to co-write or talking with someone to label or like everything is about an opportunity and music. That's, that's how that is. I remember a a show I did at Hotel Cafe where like, I looked at the audience and I'm like, what do you all do with your lives? Cause all I know is music, (laughs) you know what I mean? It's like, but it's that kind of thing. You're so in that world. Yeah. Yeah. It's it. And you almost, I mean, I mean, being there, you were there for way longer than, than I was, but being there for seven years, it becomes it like, it's, yeah, you forget that there's other stuff going on because literally everyone, you know, it's the same, same thing. And you're all living in this reality. And, um, that identity gets reinforced heavily, heavily every day. And, um, and as I said, from a young age, I, I, I felt that identity, even at five, I was like, this is who I am. I'm a musician. I'm a singer. This is who I want to be. Um, and, I cultivated and brought that into reality and I worked really hard for it. And then the pandemic came <laughs> and, um, and I'll also preface by saying I wasn't in love with where I was um, emotionally or like financially in LA. I was doing well, I was subsiding fine, but, um, but I felt again, a ceiling at, at the places that I was making money, which I had um, a weekly, like a couple times a week gig at a fancy steakhouse, which is, which like Justin Bieber, Stevie Wonder comes in. I met Stevie Wonder that way. Like Stevie Nicks, it's just like amazing opportunities. I paid well, it was pretty fun. And um, it was super consistent, which is hard to find in LA and hard to find in places. And I did that for a long time and I made good money as well as weddings and um, also wrote and stuff too. But the other stuff was my bread and butter. And it just started to feel like I was getting away from what I love about music, which is playing my songs <laughs> in front of people and, you know, being an artist. And, um, and it started to feel like there was no way I could keep growing in that trajectory because, and I could see people who were like a little bit older than me. And I could see like, there were some people on the team that were about to retire. And like, it was like a secret amongst all, all the, about the booking agent and like the rest of the 20 something year olds are like, Oh yeah. Like that old guy, they're going to kick him out any day. And I just felt so bad for them because he's a musician just like anyone else. And like, there are tons of people that love him that come in on his night. And it like, it's, it's a tough world out there in the entertainment business. And, um, and I felt very keenly, like if I decide to have a baby or if I, gain weight. Like I'm not going to have this job and I'm not going to have security. And there's literally no way I can make any more money. I'm already getting paid the most that I can get paid to do this thing. So, um, I felt, I felt like I was coming up on an, on an edge where it's like, okay, I either, I either like stop doing this and, or stop doing these gigs that have given me so much income opportunities and introduced me to a lot of my great friends. Um, and start doing something else. I don't know what, but I want to figure it out. Like, and it doesn't, didn't mean not music at the time I was thinking of other music opportunities, but it was a big, big, huge unknown. Um, and that's what I was kind of wrestling with. And then the pandemic happened and then, um, we were stuck at home for a year and towards the end of that, towards the end of 2020, um, my like grandmother fell ill and my dad was taking care of her. And as I said, I, I spent most of my a lot of my adult time away from home. So I kind of felt like, okay, well, I'm, I'm home. I can help my dad take care of my grandma. I'm going to go back home and, um, and help out. And then during that time, I also got an invitation from my sister to get my real estate license and work with her. And, um, I considered it. And at first my reaction was no, like I'm a musician again, identity, you know, it's like, I'm a musician. I'm not a real estate agent. Like I, I don't do office things. (laughs) Like I'm a musician. I'm a totally. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, I'm a creative person. I don't do that. And then I was like, well, I'm just literally on unemployment sitting here every day, stuck in my house in LA. I can't do anything. I was kind of unhappy with what was happening anyways. So might as well go home to my hometown 
learn real estate, which my whole family does, by the way. So I, I you know, that part still bothers me that I basically followed my parents' identity. They're both musicians and they're both real estate agents. So, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but um, because of all the people that I know through music, my, my parents had always told me that I would be, it, it could be a successful career for me. So, um, so I can, so I did it and I got my real estate license and I've been doing that for a year. It's actually a year this month. And I actually like it a lot. And um, I was looking for a little more stability in and um, room for growth in my financial assets. I couldn't see how I could ever retire. I couldn't see how I could buy a house. I couldn't see how I could afford to have a baby um, with what I was doing. I, I could make good money and I could take trips here and there and I could like go out to eat, but like I couldn't see how I could level up. And um, so doing real estate has has really helped me see how that can happen. And I enjoy it. And it's still, there's ways for me to make it creative. I still get to make my own schedule. And I found some, so I feel really happy that I, I found something that, um, that still can, still feels like me. And I'm still wavering between the two identities often because I still do shows here and I do shows in LA every once in a while as well. Um, I was there last weekend. And um, I also gig with, I gig with another um, group who I might, be gone every weekend over in the next like six months. So I'll be doing real estate Monday through Friday and then like flying out for gigs. And, and it's, it's a lot, but it, and it is so interesting, like coming up on your edge, it's, I'm constantly asking myself like, or I found myself recently to going, okay, like no more musician. Now you're a real estate agent. Like you're 100% real estate agent. So just like real estate mogul this shit and like make a bunch of money and, you know, get your priorities. And th that's what your, that's what your plan is. And then I got this opportunity to do all these gigs and I, and I felt the tug of like, no, you're a musician, no, you're a real estate agent, you're a musician. Uh -huh. And, um, and I feel it all the time and I'm still navigating my way through it. And it's been really heartbreaking at times. Um, because, because I love my identity as a musician. And I, I do know that I'm really a person that's a thing, a being that's neither of those things, that those are identities that I'm putting on myself. But, um, but I love the, I love the musician one. That's my favorite one. And so, um, it's really hard to, to, to forge a new path where, where both of them coexist, but it's, but it seems to be working so far. And I realize, um, most other people don't give a shit. <laughs> like, like I, like my, you know, I think part of the reason it's hard is I think other people are going to think that I failed or that, um, that it wasn't good enough or something. And um, most people don't care. I'm finding. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Like you think yeah. it's going to be this huge thing. And then like, people are like, what? Yeah. You think you're different. You think you're, you think you're different to me? Yeah. No, yeah, exactly. yeah. yeah. We're still going to get together and have dinner and do drinks. Yeah. And I'm going to come yeah. see you play and you're going to come yeah. see me play. And yeah. Yeah. So what? So I can buy a house from you now. That's dope. Yeah. Yes. You know exactly. what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, it's great. And it's honestly been enriching my life a little more because, um, because I think as a musician, I, I didn't notice how much I was doing this, but I, I mentioned before, I'm like an introverted extrovert. So I, I would do the bare minimum communication with people like who were reaching out to me, not because I didn't want to talk to them, but I just, I just felt uncomfortable that they were going to ask me for something. And I wasn't, didn't, I wasn't going to know what to say. And I was going to hurt their feelings and they wouldn't like me anymore or something. And in real estate, I'm having to reach out to a lot of different people to build um, like my network and to, to work on getting clients. And I've really realized like, oh, I never asked people about themselves like before <laughs> when, when people would like a random person who, who maybe has come to a lot of my shows, they'll like say, oh, hey, like, like, I, I don't know, happy birthday, blah, blah, blah. I'll just be like, thank you so much. Da, da, da. Like, and I don't respond with like, how's your, like, how are you doing? Like, I don't respond with that. And I'm, I've really learned, um, I'm really growing that way. <laughs> I'm like you, it's not all about you and you should ask people how they're doing. And it's, it feels better to, to connect with people than to like, keep yourself closed up and boxed away, which is kind of what I was doing. Um, and so I'm, I'm really like appreciating that. Of, yeah. Of, yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. That's a beautiful thing. And yeah, it's so interesting. It's like, so the musician identity is the one you love the most. Mm -hmm. you know? So what? <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Good you know what point. I mean? It's like, yeah. 
it's like what you said. It's like, you're not a musician. You're mm-hmm. not a real estate agent. At the end of the day, what's most important is like who, who you be underneath all that, within mm-hmm. all that, beyond mm-hmm. all that. And to know that you even have an identity yeah. that is available to you that you can embody when it's appropriate and feels good and makes sense to embody mm-hmm. is beautiful, but yeah. with it, but, but you're so much more than that, you yeah. know? And so I just, I've really loved seeing how you've been navigating this at this new identity, you know, and developing that and growing that and that it's giving you something like, you know, that you get to exercise now this muscle of mm-hmm. networking and making friends and asking deep questions, which I know as a performer is not always something that is the easiest to do, nor is it necessarily even the best thing for you to do exactly. as a performer. You have no idea who's in your audience. Mm-hmm. You, know, like you, may mm-hmm. not, you may not want to put yourself in a situation where you're really getting to know your fans <laughs> yeah. after the show or in the DMs. Yeah. Like it gets weird real quick. It's real yeah. weird, real fast if you're not careful. And so, I think I think that's the other thing about the performer side. I think you know people idolize you a little bit. And they, and so there's more like, there's more like hitting on that happens. And I think that's probably where that came from is like, oh, you're, they're going to ask me for a free performance or you're going to hit on me. And like, I don't want to do either of those things. <laughs> so I'm just going to like, boop, boop, not respond. And I'm learning that there's so much connection that can be had around that. And it's okay. I can say no, or I can stop talking to someone. And I think I just like, I just, again, the anxiety like built up and I just didn't want to deal with it. And now I'm dealing with it and it's interesting. Yeah, totally. Um, Well, I know we're coming up on the hour here, but there is one aspect that we haven't talked about. (laughs) It's okay if we talk about this, but I just find it. I'm like, I'm honestly, as like one of your BFFs, like just so proud of you, honestly, having watched you walk this particular, having you watch you navigate these particular waters. So I have watched you get engaged and then not be engaged twice, <laughs> very short period of time from the outside. Was, was, it, was it in the span of like a few years or something like that? These two? Uh, yeah. Yes. Well, yeah, let me think about that. Oh, 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 you mean like the ending of one engagement to the beginning of another engagement? Yeah, that kind of a thing. Yeah. Yeah. Let me think about that. That was um yeah, it was like it was like a year and a half. Oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, it's so good. Okay. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so yeah. So you did that. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So you did that. You own that. I will say the first, the this most recent separation feels at least from the outside looking in so much more healthy and you guys are navigating it together so beautifully at least I I feel looking at it it's so different from the inside out but from the outside in it looks it looks like talk about evolution right so I know when it comes to relationships and intimacy there's a lot of you that can relate to you know wanting a love and choosing a love that you think is something and then ends up not being that and then you might stay in it because you feel a pressure uh, to stay in it or because you don't know what to do or because you're afraid to take that leap and as somebody who has walked the path of choosing a life partner who you thought was going to be your life partner twice because I'm sure you had a certain idea of who they were or who they would be for you or who you could be for them. And then having to say no to that twice Mm -hmm. when talk about identity, talk about the way the world is looking at you, like all of those things, like you had to do that twice. Like, yeah, just walk me through that, like the courage that you had to have to, get to that place where you could find your divine no in that and Mm. move forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, the, the first one I, um, 
I realize in retrospect, which is of course always when we see all the answers <laughs> that I shouldn't have said yes to the first one. I don't think I shouldn't have said yes to the second one, but the first one I feel like shouldn't have said yes. Um, he he um, had issues with alcohol abuse and, um, and I knew that, and it was something that we had been working on a lot. Um, but I loved him a lot. And, and I had never been with anyone who had a substance abuse issue before. So I was unfamiliar with like the tactics and the cycles. Um, and I, I think that the, I, I definitely learn <laughs> so much about myself through these things because I think I pretty much brought both of these engagements about before knowing that I actually wanted to get engaged for sure which is <clears throat> pretty interesting that's <laughs> powerful so how did you do that how did you manifest these engagements mm -hmm. without even realizing that you wanted to be engaged <laughs> yeah well I think I think I unint yeah I unintentionally um what this is, what both of these engagements and their dissolutions have taught me is that, um, is that I have some abandonment issues. Um, one part that I didn't mention, not to get into it super hardcore, but like my dad, um, when I was much younger, he um, and my mom divorced and he like started a new family in a different state. And he was there for like set the first seven years of my life and then came back. So I had like, I remember very like vividly, like yearning for him to be around or he would say he would come and then he he wouldn't come like all the time um and and then even after he moved back and my little sister was around he um like didn't want to fuck up with me with her the way that he did with me so he like was at all of her first things her first day at kindergarten and like in it because of that he missed my like eighth grade play and like he'd be like well it's her first day and like I know I wasn't there for you so I want to be there for her and I'm like but I'm still here like I'm still like a 14 year old, I could use you. But, um, but we've, the weird part is that we, in my mind, we had healed that because as I talked about earlier, we played music together. We had a really, really strong bond. Um, we, we have toured together. We're super close. And so I was like, yeah, I don't have daddy issues. Like, what do you mean? I love my dad. We're super close. Um, but I, what I didn't realize is the impact that that had on me as a, as a child, which is when most of this stuff happens is like birth to, you know, it happens before, before you can even do anything about it. So, um, that being said, I think my subconscious tactic was to like, not drop hints about marriage. Cause I wasn't like, we should get married or I'd live by me a ring. It wasn't like that. It was more like, I would lead people, I would lead my partners to forever, like with me and almost like a, like a courting of their, of their heart, but in almost like a sneaky way, but I didn't realize I was doing it. Um, and, and I, and I believed it too, for myself. I was like, yeah, I want this. Like, do you want this forever? Cause like, I want this forever. And like, I just need to know, like, you know, are we on the same level? And then, and then with the first engagement, the question came and I was like, oh shit. Like, I did not think you were going to do this, but looking back on it, like I brought it about, I, I'm the one that planted the seed. I watered it. I like nurtured the soil <laughs> and like this plant came out and it was holding a ring. And I was like, uh, I guess, yes, because otherwise we have to break up right this moment and I'm not ready to break up. So yes. Right. And that was the first one. And then, um, and I also think it's because some part of us think that's just what we're supposed to do. And that's just what's, what's supposed to happen after you've been together for a certain amount of years. It's like, well, you're getting married or you're not, are you having kids or you're not? And I think that's an antiquated way to look at relationships. And I've, um, yeah, but so that was the first one. And then one day I just had enough with, um, the drinking and the, and the really like toxic behavior. And, I just woke up and I, there was just something in me that was done and there was nothing left for me to give. And I had gone back and forth for, for years about whether or not to end the engagement. And I felt a lot of pressure. I was like, well, it's not just the relationship. I, I'll be like unengaged. And like, as a woman, I also think about um, the fact that it's considered a geriatric pregnancy at 35 and like, okay, now I'm not, I'm going to be like unengaged and like, it's going to be a geriatric pregnancy. So like, I have to find someone by like X amount of time. Otherwise, like, I may not be able to have kids, which is a lot of pressure to put on your next relationship. Yeah. Um, so you came into that next relationship with 
carrying all of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 100%. And, and my current partner, we're, we're in the process of dis dissolving our partnership. Um, he's really great. And, and I don't think that me coming into it that way is the only reason that we got engaged. I think that there's a lot of potential there and we're kind of leaving it open to the future. Possibly maybe we'll come back together, but we are, we are um, breaking up and we were, we're doing it in a super healthy way. It feels healthy to me. And it's, I've never had a breakup like this before. It's usually like you have the breakup conversation and one person's mad and they're like, okay, fine. And then they leave. And then you slowly awkwardly like move your stuff out and like, it's not great. <laughs> That's how it's been for me. And this one is not like that. Um, it's been really loving and we kind of are supporting each other while we're like hurting from the breakup. It's really interesting, um, which, which is part of the reason why I, I think there's something may, maybe worth revisiting is like how we're handling this breakup. I'm like, okay, there's some like real depth here. There's some true, not true love in like, you know, the Disney sense, but like there's some, there's some true love here that's not just like who we think we're supposed to be or we're engaged. So we have to get married um, kind of kind of obligations. Yeah, it feels like <clears throat> giving yourself permission, whether it's within this relationship that you're in the process of separating from, but you may come back together in mm -hmm. or a different one, you're really giving yourself and him a chance to find yourself again and mm -hmm. have a, a commitment like that come from the most authentic, pure place mm. versus the abandoned child totally, totally. And, or the you know freaked out you know mm -hmm. 35 year old woman who's afraid of being an old lady pregnant yeah. you know what I mean like totally. you know that's you're giving really yourself a chance and that's yeah. that's really beautiful and that takes a lot of courage and I think that it's really powerful to have found you know a partner you guys are still partners you know what I mean it's like just yeah. because you decide you're going to separate doesn't mean that you can't still you know, do life together and mm -hmm. you guys are navigating that hurt together. Yeah. And that's a beautiful thing. And I think that a lot of people would be grateful to, you know, to know a kind of love like that, where it doesn't yeah. have to be, you know, you don't have to be in relationship or engaged or whatever mm -hmm. to just yeah. be there for each other. You totally. Know? Yeah. And it's, it's a new experience for me. Like I said, it's been my other my other relationships have not gone that way my other engagement did not go that way he was really mad and turned he showed parts of himself that I didn't know he had <laughs> and um yeah I'm, I'm really grateful for how this has panned out and how um how we're moving through it and I, I think like yeah the lessons I'm taking from it all is like I think we all we all have different ideas of how things need to go for ourselves and it's all a slightly different version but, um, but we, we put them on from like early childhood, from, from cultural input, from religious input, from familial input, all these things. Like, but it's just, I think maybe being adult is like constantly reevaluating that and seeing what you're doing and checking if it matches up with like how you feel versus how you think you're supposed to feel or how other people want you to feel. And I'm constantly bumping up against that and um, yeah, reevaluating. Beautiful. Well, where can people find your music or if they are in Nevada and yes. want to buy or sell a home, yes. where can people <laughs> contact you? Yes. Well, I can help you even if you're not in Nevada. Um, I know realtors all over the country and even some in Mexico. So if you um, are wanting to buy in any state, I can help you. And I have a Instagram that talks about buying homes. Um, her it, real estate Instagram <laughs> is so good. Lee and I, my fiance, we were just talking about it today. Like Whitney's content on Insta about her real estate business is like so good. It's so good. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. I've been, I work hard on it. Um, and it's, I like try to make it so it's applicable to people. Like um, it's not just Nevada, you know, it's like kind of general lending um, tips. And I, I try to make it more educational rather than just like, oh, this is what's happening in Nevada. Um, and so it, so it'd be, you know, beneficial to follow if you're ever considering buying a home or just knowing more about the process. Um, but yeah, so that's, um, your Reno realtor, no, sorry, your Reno real estate agent on Instagram. You can also search Whitney Meyer, M Y E R. 
And that account will come up as well as my music account, which is just Whitney Meyer. And um, that's where you can hear songs. You can um, find songs on Spotify, Apple Music. I've written some songs with Naya. So you can go check those out. Yeah, and- we'll include the song, the song, was it just Breathe for Your Brother Man that we released? In oh, the- yeah. I feel like there was another maybe that you worked on too that say real released in 2020. Anyway, we'll include the songs that are out that we wrote together in the show notes, as well as links to her uh, personal and music Instagram and her real estate Instagram and Triorca too. We didn't even yes. get Triorca. Oh my gosh. If you're gonna, yeah. If you're going to check out my music, check out my band yeah. Triorca. It's my favorite thing. Yeah. So All right. Well, thanks so much for being here and making the space and sharing a bit of your story, your heart, your love with us. And I think with that, we will close the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Much love to all you guys out there. Keep, keep going. Just keep going. Keep, keep, live, keep meeting your edge and evolving mm-hmm. beyond it. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> yeah.